Hi, everyone. My name is Adam Evermescu, and I am the Director of Customer Education and Optiverse at Optimizely. And as a lot of you probably already know, Optimizely is the number one experimentation platform. So that's A-B testing, personalization, recommendations. Uh, as product folks and marketing folks, many of you already use us. And if you don't, we now have uh, a full suite of server-side products rolling out, so you probably should. <clears throat> All right, cool. So we're going to talk about onboarding, education, and experimentation. We're going to talk about this uh, pretty broadly. We're not even going to jump into Pendo until a little later in the, uh, the presentation. And instead, we're going to start by talking about what role customer education can play in your overall customer adoption strategy. So this is something that not every business invests in in a meaningful way. So let's start with uh, the scary part before we, before we, we comfort each other, right? Uh, the seeds of churn are planted early, especially in a subscription software business, right? We're in SaaS, a lot of you are in SaaS, and you know that even though we want to nurture our customers towards success and have the seeds of renewal planted early, the seeds of churn are planted just as early. It's two sides of the same coin. And in fact, Preact, back when they were a customer success platform, did this uh, analysis of, uh, across the industry, what are the top sources of churn? So they asked several SaaS companies uh, across the industry. They got statistical significance on their own analysis. And the results were a little surprising. It wasn't poor customer service, overselling, org changes, weak customer marketing that were the top source of churn. It wasn't even product underperformance, although you can see that that one plays a big difference. It was poor onboarding. A lot of the time, what we do is we invest in features, 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 so that the product will not underperform. The product will perform. What we don't invest in is actually a meaningful onboarding and ongoing education experience. So I use a simple equation to think about this. We've seen some equations today. Well, there will be more. This will be on the test. Success equals desire minus friction. This is our job in educating customers, to lead them towards success. Because ongoing success is what's going to prevent churn and increase renewal and expansion and customer lifetime value. So how do we do that? There's two parts to the equation. We increase their desire, and we remove friction along the way. And that's what's going to be essential. Unfortunately, in the race towards first value for the customer, many of us are like these two women here and just tripping at the starting line. It's not the seamless experience that we need for our customers. So let's unpack the two parts of the equation. There's desire. And here, to illustrate that, I have uh, this model of crossing the chasm. This was a, a book by Jeffrey Moore. If you're familiar with it, a lot of us in product are. And in a, in a sentence, basically what it tells us is that what got us here won't get us there. The customers that we had in the early going who just get it are not the customers that we see down the line. So just because the UI is intuitive doesn't necessarily mean that uh, that's what's going to work for us as we get into our majority and, and our laggards, which is the bulk of customers we actually sell to. And if that wasn't convincing enough, let's hear it from Lincoln Murphy, who's uh, from 16 Ventures, as well as uh, he was from Gainsight previously. So he's a leader in the customer success space. His position on customer education is that we have to educate people not just on how to use our product, but quite frankly, that they need the product and what they'd even do without a product. So our job in educating customers goes far beyond just the feature tour. All right, that's desire. What about friction? So how do we remove friction? Well, we can have this very friendly uh, call center rep to answer all the questions that our customers have. But what we know is that that is not an effective strategy at scale. And this analysis by Matthew Dixon, Carrot Freeman, and Nicholas Toman, they're the ones who wrote the effortless experience from the corporate executive board. When they did their analysis, they discovered that 57% of inbound support calls 
came from customers who went to the website first. What does that mean? That means customers are trying to self-serve. Customers are trying to get what they need without talking to you. And a lot of us know this already, but we don't provide an experience that really captures that or emphasizes that. So you have an army of CSMs and support reps and solutions architects and you know, whatever else you have in your customer facing team. There are other roles that do this too. And they're all working really hard to resolve problems for the customer, to help them drive adoption. But how scalable is that? What are you actually doing to educate your customer proactively? So if you don't do it right, you're probably hearing these things or, or saying them. If you're saying them, stop saying them. If you're hearing them, let's, let's educate the people who are saying them. Uh, sure, I train them. Why are they still asking these questions? This is like, but I train them. Uh, OK, well, if you train them, then why are they still asking these questions? Uh, it's in our knowledge base somewhere. Can, can customers just find that? It's, it's there. OK, but why aren't customers finding it? Uh, our product is so intuitive, we don't need to train customers. You don't need to train customers how to use an iPhone, right? You heard that one before? You've said it before? OK. <laughs> and I, I think this is part of the problem. This is, this is our model for what training customers look like, is that if I can somehow extract all the knowledge from my CSM's brain and then just put it into the customer's brain, <laughs> this is what we think training is. But we're doing it wrong. We are doing it wrong if that's what we think training a customer actually looks like. So thank you, that was my presentation. Applause, please. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Usually someone pity claps there, but uh, thank, thank you. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is why I think we're doing it wrong. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do a little clapping activity for you right now. And what I'm going to clap is a song. Right, so you, you have some information now. Uh, I would like you to guess what song I am clapping. <clears throat> okay, raise your hand if you know what song that was. Is it Hero by Enrique Iglesias? No. <laughs> but, but I appreciate your fearlessness in guessing. Yesterday by the Beatles. That's right. So you knew it. Well, let's give you a round of applause. Right, so now we all got to clap, so that's fun, right? Um, how, many, how many other people knew that that was Yesterday by the Beatles? No one in the room knew. So let's talk about crossing the chasm. You're the early adopter, and everyone else is the majority. Most of our customers don't just get it, and yet, when we try to educate them, we have all the context in our heads. The CSM knows what the best practices are in most cases. The support rep knows how to resolve those issues. And yet, when we actually go about educating the customer, we are giving them the clapping, but not the song. We have the context, but we're not giving it to them. So our job as product and customer success and UX professionals is to help customers hear the song so that everyone can do as well as you just did in identifying what we're actually trying to communicate. All right, so most of what we think of training and documentation is actually just product knowledge dump, and our job is to fix that. Because customers don't care about using their, your product. As, as painful as that is for us to hear, they don't intrinsically care, right? They care about outcomes. So for Optimizely, we look at that in terms of adoption, right? Uh, our customer success team, our customer education team, our product team are all working together to drive adoption, and we quantify that through adoption metrics. So for us, success means ongoing statistical significance. If you're running experiments that are achieving statistical significance on the goals that you set up, then we know that you are more likely to be successful, you're more likely to renew, you're more likely to expand, so on and so forth. If we're increasing desire correctly, then we're seeing our, our mouths continue to uh, improve over time. We have more collaborators logging in on a more frequent basis to run those experiments, and we're removing friction along the way. So 
if we can get our customers increasing their experiment starts, that means that they were able to do the things that uh, might otherwise have prevented them from starting that experiment. And so when we think about how we actually achieve those outcomes, we need to educate the customer to do it. Uh, I think a lot of us just have the wrong model of what customer education actually is or should be. Because customer education, historically, like when you go to, back to the on-prem world in uh, the, the late Cambrian era or whenever that was, uh, customer education was historically a, a professional service on a P&L. And newer companies take a different approach. They say, uh, okay, well, uh, that, that CSM is really good at uh, conveying information to the customer. Let's call that customer education. Oh, good, we have a customer education team now. Uh, we have to be more disciplined about it. So we have to stop saying things like, uh, customers keep asking for on-site training as a service. Maybe that should be our customer education program. Or uh, you know, someone needs to write all these support articles. Can we have that guy do it? Or uh, CSMs deliver this training over and over. Like Maybe someone should do that full time. Uh, Salesforce has an academy. I like Trailhead. Let's, let's, make, let's make that. That's a cool marketing activity. We have to be more disciplined and intentional about the way that we educate our customers if we want to see that payback in adoption. So if you're doing it right, customer education is actually the scale engine of your customer success team. You are levering, leveraging that knowledge that your CSMs and your support reps and your solutions architects and all those people are conveying to customers one-to-one -one and really using your education program to drive desire minus friction equals success. All right, so we did it through Optiverse. Optiverse is our consolidated portal for community, knowledge base, academy, and a whole lot more. This was something that when we uh, started doing it, we took several iterations to get to this point. But one thing that we were hearing from our customers is that discoverability was really important. They wanted to know what resources were available, what knowledge was available, where to find it. So we put it all together for them. And when you go to Optiverse, you can see there's an a emphasis on fresh content that's aggregated through the, the three channels that are available there, the community, knowledge base, and academy. Uh, we also have links to certification and other key education activities there. We have a unifying global nav that connects all of Optiverse together, so it's very easy to navigate. And again, this comes through in discoverability. Customers tell us that it's relatively easy to find what they're looking for within Optiverse. So here are the components. Oh. We have a community. It's powered by Lithium. I have all the vendors up here so you can see what vendors we use. Uh, this is where customers can interact with each other and collaborate around both industry topics and support topics. It's not just a support community. It's also a place for customers to share thought leadership in the experimentation space, since a lot of people are still trying to figure out what those best practices are. We have our knowledge base, which is not just a support site. Our knowledge base also contains uh, over 70 articles that are related to industry best practices testing strategy, personalization strategy, because these are things that our customers are looking for as well. Our academy and certification, our customers were telling us, you know, we want to understand how to go from zero to 60 with Optimizely, and so our academy provides those linear learning paths to get to value. And all of this we do intentionally with educational values. So we believe that you learn through interaction. If learning is a passive experience and you don't get a chance to be hands-on, to challenge yourself, to learn by doing and by failing sometimes, then you probably aren't learning. It's not just about opening up your CSM's head and cramming it into the, the customer's head. We believe in starting with why. We think that industry education, on the whole, is more important than product training. And you're going to be motivated to learn if you understand why this is going to help you do your job, not just what the features in the product do. We drive 80-20 customer value, so we really focus on documenting and training on the things that, that the 20% of things that help 80% of our customers, uh, and that means that we really leave behind a lot of the edge cases and just don't let that take up a lot of our time. A lot of that goes on to the community. And then test, learn, iterate, right? We're, we're a testing company, we're an experimentation company, so we take an agile approach towards development, uh, we test a lot of what we roll out, we learn from it, and we iterate aggressively based on that. So after we rolled out Optiverse, we actually did see a really nice deflection rate from our, our uh, support team. So you could see that 
Before April 2014, when we first released Optiverse, support tickets were climbing up unsustainably uh, because support tickets are a natural consequence of your customer base growing, especially if you're not doing anything to provide uh, you know, self-service. Basically, the moment we released Optiverse, that trend immediately reversed. And within eight months of having released Optiverse, our ticket uh, contact rate was down to about a third of what it had been previously. So that was a big initial win. That was the, the first area that we thought we could make an impact on. But again, I mentioned earlier, our focus has shifted more towards adoption. So we do ongoing analyses as far as how Optiverse engagement helps with product usage and adoption. So you can see we do an ongoing analysis where we look at the correlation between number of courses completed and experiments created in Optimizely. There is a positive correlation there. Uh, just kind of, a, a I guess, a, an insider tip for us. Our business doesn't really care whether that correlation is reverse causation, because as long as they know that adoption of Optiverse is a behavior of a successful customer, that means we still need to provide Optiverse to them, right? It doesn't matter if Optiverse is causing that or if it's simply that our successful customers use Optiverse. And then we, we did do a predictive analysis, though, so we could answer that question more definitively. And what we found was that customers who view our educational materials or interact with our educational materials in months one through three are more likely to run additional monthly unique visitors in Optimizely in month four. So we do know there's a, a, a predictive and causal relationship as well. And our customers have responded to it. So this uh, quote comes from one of our product managers who went on site to a strategic customer visit. I'm not going to say their name, but uh, you will all definitely know who they are. They're one of the largest technology companies in the world. Uh, Self-serve support gives us a competitive edge. This product manager, when he went on site, assumed that a strategic customer wouldn't care much about our knowledge base or Optiverse. Uh, they were viewed more as just self-serve tools for our, our broader customer base, something to engage with uh, you know, during the trial or if you were uh, you know, a self-serve customer. But our point of contact said that these were a lifesaver for her as she was building her community of practice and her center of excellence at the company. Because as she was evangelizing Optimizely internally, she was using Optiverse with her team. She loved that she could just Google whatever she was looking for and uh, she would be able to find it. So this was actually really important to us as we were crossing the chasm into larger, more strategic customers as well. Because we were moving from these self-serve practitioners who just get it to companies who need a little more support, a little more hand-holding, a little more enterprise-grade service. So bigger teams, more personas, more verticals. Our buyer and our users weren't the same person. There wasn't always that intrinsic motivation. And what we know is that people were using Optiverse, right? The knowledge base is the most viewed property aside from Optimizely.com itself, Optimizely.com being our app and our marketing site. So we know that customers are looking for it, and organic search was a huge driver of it. But you know what else was a big driver of it? it was in product. So we believe that you know, in, in order of ascending value, one-to-one -one teams are great for hands-on interaction. Uh, customers will file support tickets when they need it. Education resources are better because at least they're scalable, but we were still missing out on an opportunity to really put this in the context of what the customer does every day and really get hands-on practice in the product. We know that when we did put these cues in the product, customers were using them. So uh, what we have here is our most viewed pages in Google Analytics, and guess what? Those are pages that are surfaced contextually in the product. So our how long to run a test article uh, is right there on our results page. It's also on our sample size calculator. And our troubleshooting compatibility mode warning is uh, surfaced right there in the product. So we know that when we're showing this to customers, customers are using it. So we should do more of that. But meanwhile, in the product, we hadn't really captured the same success that Optiverse was seeing. So we really needed to work with our product team to make sure that we were offering a better experience overall. So this is uh, from useronboard.com, Sam Hulick, one of my, uh, one of my favorite sites. Um, they're being very gracious to us overall, but our, our guiders were stuck in 2013 uh, from Optimizely's earlier days. So you know, he's, he said we, uh, we heavily optimized our experience, which we did initially, um, but we weren't really keeping up with 
the new customers that we were uh, acquiring as we had crossed the chasm. Our onboarding was really set up for those initial customers who just got it. And he pointed out some key usability uh, issues that we were having with our guiders as well. This is a, a completely hand-rolled system that you're looking at right now called Guiders.js. It is open source, you can use it, but you, know, you presumably use Pendo, so you shouldn't use <laughs> Guiders.js. I guarantee you it'll give you more headaches than it will give you uh, um, any pleasure. So this was our flow. You, uh, you went through this project creation screen, and we said, welcome to the tour, and we pushed the tour at you, and if you said no thanks, you never saw it again. And uh, we showed you how to do a few things, you know, edit an element, uh, create a variation. Oh, here's, here's advanced settings. Uh, we're not gonna tell you what any of them are. And as it turns out, a lot of those advanced settings are actually necessary for you to achieve any sort of value with Optimizely, but you know, that's, that's cool. It's in the options menu, it's there when you need it later. Uh, but we're not gonna show it to you. Oh, but we'll show you how to save an experiment and uh, start one, and cool, that's over. But what haven't you learned yet? Well, we did an analysis of what wasn't covered in that onboarding flow and what impact that had on our knowledge base views as well as our ticket categorization. Turns out one of the biggest uh, ticket, the sources of tickets is around experiment setup, which we weren't adequately onboarding you in the product how to do. And for that matter, if you looked at the pages getting the most uh, volume in our knowledge base, a lot of that was stuff that just wasn't covered in the onboarding, and a lot of it didn't even have to do with features, a lot of it had to do with the strategy behind using Optimizely, because guess what? Optimizely is pretty easy to use. Experimentation is hard to master have to know what you're doing. You have to approach with intention. Um, and then, you know, after onboarding, we did have some in-product help, but uh, I, I challenge you to find where the help button is on that image in the right. Uh, I'm, I'm looking right now, and I have to squint to find it, and I know where it is. It was also verbose. So, you know, we were, we were battling perception a little bit here, right? Why don't we just make the product more intuitive and let that do the job? So this is a conversation we were having with, with our product team. And we, what we were discovering together, uh, and again, I, I have Lincoln Murphy to back me up here, is that in-product education is not just a cure for poor UX, right? If you're doing in-product right, you should have a very intuitive experience in your applica application. You should be uh, creating an experience that intrinsically increases desire and removes friction. But even the most intuitive experience is not going to help you understand what you don't know. It'll only help you do what you're trying to do easily. So compensation for poor UI UX, eh, not a good reason to do education. That's why on-prem vendors sent their teams to training for like six days. But what about inspiration and context for new users beyond the general workflow? Let's help them understand what they could be doing that they're not doing today and how this helps them do their jobs better. How about contextual support flows to resolve friction as it occurs? Those are good, let's focus on those. And so when we set about uh, revamping our own in-product education, we followed a pretty simple hypothesis for the project at large. On the right you can see, uh, this, is, this is something our design team put up in the office. They had a bunch of customer quotes uh, and we all put sticky notes on them to respond to them and I, I, I just wrote in-product education all over them. The more the tool can guide me and the fewer options I have to screw it up, the better, this customer says. I agree. Let's help you understand how to get to meaningful use. So our hypothesis was this. If we surface the why, what, and how of Optimizely in product during onboarding, then customers will see value in a shorter amount of time because they want the quickest path to value. So it's all about first value leading to adoption. And that's what led us to Pendo. And so we were able to throw out Guiders.js and create a much better in-product onboarding experience. So in our new tour, we are surfacing a lot more of the why, the what, and the how. And I'll show you a few things that worked for us. We tested this, uh, actually before I do, I'll show you some of the results. So again, knowing that this was all about adoption, um, we looked at what happened if a user was interacting with a guide versus if that guide didn't exist. So as it turns out, if the guide didn't exist, they had about a 13% chance of, intent, of completing that goal during the session. Uh, however, if they actually had the guide, that shot up to uh, 50%, over 50%, which is a lot better. Still not great, there's still more that we have to do, but 
a pretty dramatic improvement during that session for the user to actually be able to do the thing that we want them to do. So clearly they're seeing more value in it. And we tested, we learned, we iterated. Uh, a lot of this is based on ongoing experimentation that we've done and we're continuing to experiment. So some things we've learned. You know who your customers are, so make onboarding for them, right? You heard about personalizing your experience a little more. Don't do the one size fits all. So in addition to user roles, one thing we look at is industry vertical. So we pipe in an integration with demand base into Pendo where we know what industry vertical you're in and we will tell you that throughout your onboarding. We don't just do this to be creepy, we use it to surface actual uh, guidance based on your industry. So if we know you're in B2B or in e-commerce, we can recommend you different types of experiments to set up or different audiences you might want to use that other people in your vertical use. Find the right brand, uh, balance between on-brand and distinctive. This is something that we learned through iteration. Our, the, the initial implementation we did looked too much like a generic optimizely modal, so customers didn't really know what they were looking at and that onboarding was a, a different part of that experience. So we sought to make our onboarding guides look a little different from the general product UI. Uh, I like this in, in Salesforce as well. Recommend a workflow whenever possible. So this is the, uh, the Pendo launcher, and we were using that to show the customer what it was that they should be doing and help at least uh, tell them when they've done it. So these were the five steps that we uh, had seen customers perform more often to achieve value. So we just wanted to surface those for them instead of saying, here's an options menu, you know, go to town. Don't just say what, start with why and set expectations for your customers. This doesn't have to be a long, drawn out thing. Just include a sentence about why you should be using this feature. How is this actually going to help you do something better? Uh, the other thing that you can see here is voice and tone matter. Um, keep it short, keep it punchy, be direct, but have some character, right? Actually engage with your audience. And you have multimedia, so use it, right? We have uh, great in-product support videos. Uh, these, are, these are a big hit on our knowledge base. Customers give us great feedback about them. Why not put them directly in the product so the customers who learn through uh, video have a way to learn what they're trying to learn? Balance the push and pull functions of onboarding as well as contextual support throughout uh, the, the experience. Think about training versus support. So by push and pull, I mean you don't just want to be constantly spamming out guides to your users, you want to give them an opportunity, especially if they dismiss something, to get it back later, to re-engage with that content on their own terms. And it's not just onboarding, right? We have to think about this throughout the customer lifecycle. Keep nurturing your customers over time to make them successful. So originally I had, uh, I had Sisyphus rolling the rock up the, uh, up, the, up the mountain, and then I realized that was really depressing, and I was probably just projecting a little bit as a, as a customer success professional. And then I realized that um, I, one time I got this really weird fortune. In, this was like takeout that I got. And it said, customer service is like taking a bath. You have to keep doing it. And I have no idea what that means, but I find it inspirational. <laughs> and what I take from it is that you have to keep nurturing the customer over time. So we look at ongoing opportunities with Pendo. This is one reason I'm really excited about continuing to use Pendo to achieve our adoption goals, not just during onboarding, but beyond. So for success, that part of the equation, we want to continue to show our customers the next step in their maturity. We have a maturity model that we use. We know where customers are in that maturity model. And so we want to continue to use Pendo over time to surface ideas and best practices that will help them get to the next step, not just in their product usage, but in their experimentation practice maturity. Desire. Uh, we want to continue to use it to surface strategic tips throughout. Because again, customers don't care about features unless they care about the strategy behind them. We also want to use this for product marketing, feature releases, help customers understand what the, what the features they haven't used yet are and what's new. And finally, removing friction. We're starting to use Pendo a lot more to surface contextual help around different friction points that you may encounter in Optimizely, because let's face it, every product has them. And these are actually doing really well. So we're now just going down the list of uh, our top support issues and plugging in in-product deflection flows for them. Customers appreciate having this in time when they're looking for it. All right, so just to summarize, Optiverse 
is a key differentiator for Optimizely in the marketplace. Because we put in the work to build an intentional customer education experience, we're seeing the rewards of that. We have salespeople tell us, part of the reason that I was able to sell this deal against the competitor is because of our self-serve resources. And customers reflect this too. This is a really nice piece of feedback we got recently, MPS 10. The help system is fantastic with a depth of knowledge that even advanced users can learn from. Blows away the competition, which is awesome because we're educating our customers and a lot of our competitors aren't. Even though Optimizely also has the most intuitive UI of most of the people in our, uh, in our space. And more broadly for you, education is a competitive differentiator for your business. So treat it like one. Let's treat customer education as a defined program, not an ad hoc activity. Let's stop taking uh, the information out of our CSM's brains and really think about how to nurture our customer throughout their life cycle through defined, mature customer education. All right, so uh, you know, if you have questions, I'm happy to talk. I'm happy to uh, share my experiences. I would love to learn from you. So uh, as they say, catch me outside.